Chapter Thirty Three of Old Wells Dug Out. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcia Payne. Old Wells Dug Out by Thomas Talmage. Cessation of Experiment. Thou shalt see greater things than these. John chapter 1, verse 50. On this, the fifth anniversary of my settlement as your pastor, I desire to tell the story of this church, a story that has never yet been told. I tell it in answer to American and European letters, so numerous that, with the aid of a secretary, I have not been able to answer them. I tell it in recognition of the goodness of God. I tell it out of justice to the men and women who sit before me, out of justice to some who have already entered upon the white-robed congregations of heaven. It is a story of escapes, deliverances, losses, self-sacrificing achievement, wild tragedy, divine help, and of worldwide sympathy that I do not think belongs to any other church of the century. There are passages that remind me of the going of the Israelites through the Red Sea, and yet it shall not be an epic, nor a lyric, nor a dithyrambic, but only a plain pastoral. Seated in my Philadelphia home, the call came from this church. The eldership deceived me in no wise. They told me it was almost an extinct church. Nineteen members were all that could be rallied to a congregational meeting to make out the call. It was accepted for the reason that the church was flat down, and I said to myself, that will be just the place in which to try, on a large scale, a free church, without any established hindrances in the way and so putting my trust in god and confronting the derision of some of my best personal friends at what they called a wild undertaking i came to this the fairest city under the sun blessed be her churches prospered be her commerce christianized be all her schools the first summer we enlarged the old chapel and multiplied the seating capacity in every possible way according to the most approved style our pew rents went up and as the pew rents went up my heart went down the next spring the unanimous cry was for a new church and the trustees assembled to decide what it should be with a suppressed excitement such as I never before or since felt, I went into a neighbor's parlor to lay before the trustees the plan of a free church. I tried to show them in that conversation that it is ungospel and unchristian to make a man's financial qualification the test of pew holding and to show them that we had no right to knock down under an auctioneer's hammer to the highest bidder a man's chances for heaven there was a long pause after a while one of the brethren remarked i have no doubt that a church on that plan would be the highest style of gospel church but where would we get the money to carry on such a project i replied put your trust in god and depend upon the voluntary subscriptions and contributions of the people and since my own salary may be in the way i now here and for all time to come discharge you of all financial responsibility to me personally give me a free church and if you cannot support me then by pen and lecturing platform i will take care of myself well said one of the brethren if the dominie believes in the plan as much as that i think we can afford to believe in it and i move we have a free church a resolution that passed with a unanimous i 
then there came around about me a band of consecrated men and women sworn to do this work and if i ever forget their fidelity to christ and their adherence to the good cause may my tongue be forever still the first question was to find a site for the building committees were appointed and went up and down the city looking for a place they having decided that we must have a place one hundred and fifty feet front by one hundred feet deep and after weeks of searching they found within three doors of the old chapel just the place one hundred and fifty feet front by one hundred feet deep although the lot is larger now than it was then that was the size of it then the place was foreordained from all eternity to be the place where we should build i was often asked and i asked myself why wasn't that lot taken god was keeping it for us the next question to be decided was who shall be the architect i went to one of the prominent architects of new york and said give us a church in amphitheatrical shape he figured on it a few weeks and said an amphitheatrical building is not churchly i went to another distinguished architect and said give us an amphitheatrical building where the people can see each other's faces instead of the back of the head and where we can all be gathered as in a great home circle and where nothing shall be angular he figured on it a while and at the end of four weeks said to me that an amphitheatrical building would not be churchly one day a young man came into my room and said have you decided upon an architect for the building i replied no said he would i have any chance i replied any man young or old who can give us an amphitheatrical church where the people can all be seated in sympathy with each other will be our architect then i drew out on the back of a letter in twenty strokes the general idea and said if you can bring that out with architectural skill you will be our man so this plan was developed that it was a good one i take from the fact that there have been scores of churches since built on the same plan then the trowel began to click and the hammer to thump and the building rose as we were to build it for a temporary structure to last but two years in three months the whole affair was done but mark you without having raised one dollar of contribution toward it we depended upon the sale of the old church for the building of the new but the purchasers of that building failed to meet their payments and so the building came back upon our hands then after the new building was done we had to go through the work of attempting to pay for a church entirely completed and some of you may know what tough work that is then we went on organizing making hundreds of experiments in hundreds of things because we had no precedent no antecedent yet the work all the time progressed at our very first communion in the old tabernacle more than ninety souls professed faith in christ at the second communion in the old tabernacle more than fifty souls at the third communion in the old tabernacle more than forty souls and that is the only way i know how to calculate the advancement of the church though you build a church as grand as st paul's of london and have a line of carriages with rosetted coachmen reaching from here to prospect park i would abhor it if there were no conversions that church is an accursed thing which knows nothing about soul saving pull it down and use its timbers and its stones for bowling alleys and theaters they are not so objectionable because they pretend to be what they are but a church which does nothing but rock souls into an eternal sleep 
under a gilded canopy is a gigantic hypocrisy and defies the bolts of high heaven well the work went on on the following summer we found that our tabernacle was too straight for us and so we enlarged it at an expense like building another new church meanwhile our church had sailed down into calm financial waters and one december night the trustees of the church assembled to look over the affairs of the church and they examined the income and the outgo and saw that the next year they would have a positive surplus they clapped their hands and sat up very late that night talking the matter over and they said this project of a free church which some have caricatured and many have doubted has proved to be a success it was about eleven o'clock at night when the sexton shut the door of the old ironclad alas that was the last night of the tabernacle that ark would never float any more souls into glory its work was done and if when a christian man dies the air is full of spirits coming and going when a christian church is about coming to its closing moments i think that angelic spectators move forward and backward in the scene i think that that night the air was full of them when next morning at ten o'clock the cry of fire was lifted it was not a hoarse uproar but it was a voice with tears in it i said to a man the other day when did you become a christian he replied when the old tabernacle burned i don't cry often i want you to understand but i cried that morning and i cried all day wasn't it awful oh lord jesus great head of the church what a day that was when thy children stood before their burning altar some sighed some wrung their hands some fainted invalids with unnatural strength got up from their couches and looked out at it it was the death throe of a church its departing spirit spreading abroad wings of flame its groan the falling timbers let the firemen take off their glazed hats and twenty thousand excited spectators bow down before the catafalque of fire dead dead ashes to ashes the loss was the more complete because it was an iron structure on which we had not been able to get adequate insurance so we were as thoroughly rubbed out as a sponge rubs out the sum of a boy's slate at school then there came sympathetic letters i never got so many letters in one day in my life as i got on the following day and then there came practical help one thousand dollars from dresden germany where they make pictures help from sheffield england where they make knives from glasgow scotland where they make steamers from edinburgh where they make scholars from paris where they make revolutions from london where they make everything it was not so much the amount they gave as the way they gave it they said they had seen the fire in yorkshire and in old essex and among trossachs they told us we were prayed for among the manchester and birmingham operatives you know how it was in our own city twenty-six churches in as many hours were offered for our occupation they offered us their main audience rooms they offered us their lecture rooms and what they did not offer us would not be worth mentioning the demonstration of christian brotherhood was so magnificent that as soon as i could get the cinders and the tears wiped out of my eyes i said well brethren i am glad the thing has burned up we only built it for two years anyway and it was not large enough now let us rise up and have a larger and a better structure to make the one year of our exile the more bearable the lord god came down with his spirit in the academy of music some people said you had better not go there it is a theatre a secular place but we went there 
and had it dedicated we dedicated the director's room in that building by a prayer meeting twice every sabbath we dedicated the green room by cries of what must i do to be saved we dedicated the platform by the story of the saviour's love and never anything else but that morning and night we dedicated the boxes by men and women who rose asking for prayers we dedicated the main audience room by five hundred and thirteen souls professing to have found the peace of the gospel three hundred and seven of them connecting themselves with our church and others going elsewhere because we had as yet no home and though that academy of music may be the scene of secular entertainments for many a year there shall be no power in the voice of prima donna or in the blast of brazen instruments to drown out st martin's and coronation still rolling among the arches meanwhile we selected a new architect one who did not think that an amphitheatrical building would be unchurchly one who after long experience in putting up some of the largest structures in england and the united states brought all his achievements to a culmination in plans for this temple the women the lord has written the record on high i cannot read it until i come up there the women by fair and by personal solicitation raised money the board of trustees brooded after many of midnight over the plans the work went on by what toil by what hope deferred by what anxiety i cannot tell until on the twenty second of february the veil was drawn from our eyes and there rose before our vision this building grander than our brightest anticipations strong as the everlasting hills and beautiful as a midsummer's dream offering seating capacity to several thousands more than any protestant church in america there remained but two things to be tested can we pay for it will it be occupied the first question you answered when on the opening day you put in the lord's lap thirty six thousand dollars making a record for yourselves which while it has won the admiration of christendom will be a page you will be glad of in the great day when christ shall say well done good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things be thou ruler over ten cities the other question was will all the pews be assigned for mind you though we are a free church we are neither a mob nor a rabble though the pews are all free from taxation yet they are formally assigned that every father and mother may have their family between them that this sabbath they may sit where they sat last sabbath and next sabbath where they sat this sabbath that a home feeling may be cultured that the church may be organized disciplined for practical christian work as it could not be if the pews were not assigned we built the church so large that the trustees said and i said that if in one or two years we can assign all these pews to families we shall be satisfied the church has been open only about six weeks yet two weeks ago we completed the assignment of all the pews a work that would have been done the night of the opening if there had been time and so we find that instead of the building being too large it is already too small now if this church shall ever doubt god's goodness or his willingness to take us straight through any righteous undertaking then we deserve to have this building go down into the ashes of a ruin from which it shall never be resurrected or swallowed of an earthquake that leaves not one brick or shingle behind oh give thanks unto the lord for his goodness for his mercy endureth for ever not unto us not unto us o lord but unto thy name be the glory 
if God ever defended a church, if God ever led a church, if God ever blessed a church, if God ever saved a church, this is the church. And now I demand of all those who are here today, and of all those to whom these words shall come, that they take this free church out of the list of experiments and put it down in the list of accomplished facts. There are two or three things we have proved. In the first place, we have proved that free churches are a financial possibility. The reason that in like undertakings in most places they have failed has been because they have been on a small scale, or because they have been in a mean structure, or because they have been with poor singing or in a repelling neighborhood. Give a free church a fair chance, and the right kind of a neighborhood, and you shall gather within its walls all classes, the rich and the poor, the cultured and the ignorant. Just the kind of church our Lord Jesus would favor, the rich and the poor meeting together, the Lord the maker of them all. Do you know this, that nine-tenths of the pew-renting churches in this country at the end of the year depend upon a few rich men to come and put their hands in their pockets up to the elbow to meet the deficit. Now I contend that that is not the way to do. Throw the whole responsibility on the people and they will meet it. They love to be trusted. Was there ever a grander illustration of the willingness of the people of this country to support a free church than on the 22nd of February. Mind you, it was in the midst of great financial depression. Mind you, it was like the building of three churches in three years, the first tabernacle built in 1871, the enlargement of that structure, which was almost like erecting another building for expense, in 1872, then this structure in the early part of 1874. Do you believe that a church conducted on any other principle could have roused up enough sympathy to be able to build three churches in a little over three years? I throw not. Oh, we were tempted again and again to go back to the old plan. I was offered, as some of you know, $20,000 per year salary if I would allow or consent to the selling of the pews in the old tabernacle. But we had consecrated ourselves to the work of building a free church, and we do not want any rest from it until we rest in Greenwood, the pleasant bed where I have a great many good friends sleeping this morning. We proved another thing, and that is that a free church can be made attractive to the refined and the cultured. The stereotyped object all over the world to a free church has been, you break down the barriers of society, and then the cultured and the refined will not come into such a place. We have put the falsehood upon that objection to a free church. There is not anywhere, there is not in any church in this land or in England, more educated men and women more professional men, more lawyers, doctors, artists, teachers, more men who can make an intelligent public address upon every question of finance, politics, morals, and religion, so that when a man introduces his family in this Christian association, he introduces them into the highest style of refinement. I have wandered up and down the world, and I suppose I have seen as much of it as any man of my age, and I now say that it is my highest ambition to have my own children worthy of the Christian, elevated society in which I have here introduced them. Again, we have proved that the people will come to receive a literal and unvarnished gospel. The impression is abroad that you must fix up the gospel to suit the age, instead of fixing up the age to suit the gospel. 
and young men coming out of our theological seminaries have the impression that they must palliate the prejudices of society and must cover over the natural rottenness of human heart and that they must tell men what very clever people they are and that they only need to be pressed in a little one way and pulled out a little the other way and then they will be all right and they say all you want is development is it development you might as well go to a man bent double with the cramps of asiatic cholera and tell him that all he wants is development it is a lie he needs to have his disease killed so that he can get well until our heart is changed by the grace of god it is scabbed and ulcerous with a great leprosy and it is not development we want but it is the cure of an eating loathsome blasting damning leprosy our whole nature throughout and throughout and throughout wrong needs to be made over and over and over again i wish that every word of that passage could come down with five tons weight of emphasis except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god though he had given one hundred thousand dollars to religious institutions though he never used a bad word in his life though he paid all his debts though he lived on the tip-top round of respectability except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god but so little do we hear about this doctrine of regeneration in this day that it is almost considered indelicate for a man to read in a public assemblage the words of christ to nicodemus about the new birth and as to there being any hell if we make any allusion to that it must be with exquisite circumlution as the place of high temperature or the world insalubrious or as a minister recently called it the great elsewhere i say to the young men who are studying for the ministry and there are thirty connected with this congregation if you have any idea that it is necessary to preach an emasculated gospel in order to get people to come and hear it you make a vast mistake an eminent minister of new york said to me some time ago i have a very large audience but they are all christians i cannot get the worldly people to come in and listen to me i hear that a good many worldly people come to hear you you must preach some very strange thing what did you preach about yesterday well i replied i preached yesterday morning on seek ye the lord while he may be found and in the evening i preached about strive to enter in at the straight gate said he is that all yes i replied that is all oh my friends there is a judgment seat in every man's heart which tells him that the bible is true and if it be true the wicked and the righteous cannot go to the same place so i say young men who are entering the ministry if you really want a fresh theme if you really want a novel theme to preach about preach the old gospel do not preach about development that is hackneyed do not preach about the darwinian theory of the origin of our race that is worn out but if you want something new really new so new that tens of thousands of people in this day do not know anything about it then give them repentance in the morning and faith at night and in order to variety next sabbath give them faith in the morning and repentance at night i believe that within the next twenty years there will be an earthquake amidst the american and english pulpits and that those which have adhered to the old gospel will stand and that those which have preached anything else will go down paul cries out with great emphasis if any one though he be an angel from heaven preach any other gospel let him be accursed where is theodore parker's pulpit today he was the most fascinating man i ever heard a mighty man 
but he denied the divinity of christ and denied the inspiration of the scriptures where is his pulpit today boston tried to patch it up and prop it up but when theodore parker died his pulpit died with him where is the pulpit of edward irving the most brilliant man that ever stood in the pulpit of england he forsook the simplicity of his father's faith and when edward irving died his pulpit died with him but while those men were preaching each in his day the one in boston and the other in london there were self-sacrificing men in our western wilderness preaching jesus and the resurrection they died of the malaria from the canabrakes but what became of their pulpit it multiplied into five thousand other pulpits and the song for which bishop asbury and george reynolds and jacob kruber gave the pitch is still humming amidst the beech woods beyond the bluffs of the mississippi now this church has been gathered and built as an exponent of the literal gospel so it shall stand that the lord has approved our plan in the past i have only to state that eight hundred and ninety-two souls have connected themselves with this church through these five years while by letters from all parts of this land and from england scotland ireland australia and the islands of the sea we have an intimation that through your prayers and the help that you have been able to give your pastor thousands of souls have been brought into the kingdom of christ the old gospel is the power of god and the wisdom of god unto salvation but now five years are gone god has closed the fifth volume never to be opened until the fiery fingers of the judgment shall open it amidst a flying heaven and a burning earth during those five years a good many have gone out from us into the eternal world some of them i fear went unprepared it is absurd for a man to preach a sermon in which he implies that all the dead are happy some of those who went out from us during the past five years into the eternal world gave no evidence of repentance there was in their last struggle a look of terror about the face that i did not like they mentioned in their last moments the name of father or mother or wife or child but they did not mention the name of jesus jesus the name high over all in hell and earth and sky they did not speak of him i could not sleep nights asking myself the question was it my fault did i give them fair warning god have mercy upon their soul would be an appropriate prayer this morning if it were not too late but oh how many of our friends during these five years have gone away in christian peacefulness the evening came on them with the soft step of the dew there was sobbing in the room and there were wailings that made the heart ache and cries of what will we do without father how lonely the world will be without mother speak my darling once more do you know me say my child do you know me ah no wonder they made no response how could they take your hand when christ had it in both of his how could they hear your voice when the heavenly escort come to fetch them home were in full chant how could they see you in the turned down light of the sick room when the morning of heaven was surging in upon their soul at full tide see see there are angels in the room oh thy dying looks those enchanted faces those closings expostulations if i could this morning bring those five years of christian deathbed triumphs before you you would spring to your feet shouting the glory and those radiant ones who have gone up from your homes would seem moving up and down again through these very aisles and you would see their brows garland with joy and their necks jeweled with light and as they looked upon you their countenances sympathetic for your loneliness you would want to die too so as to be with them do not cry do not cry parents 
you will get back your child. Sorrowful orphans, you will see father again, you will see mother again. God will wipe away all tears from your eyes. During these five years, 32 of our members have gone out of life, and they all went away in the sunrise. Blessed be God, I knew them here, and I will know them better there. And now, as a church, we put out into the future unknown, so far as particulars are concerned, but we know one thing about it. Thou shalt see greater things than these. We have only just built the fort out of which we are going to fire upon the Lord's enemies. We have only just planted the stake from which we are going to swing out in the offing the gospel net. We really believe that when we have had hundreds brought to God, we will have thousands. We mean to pray the church through. To God be the glory for the past. In God is our hope for the future. You and I may die. That will not have anything to do with the cause. The cause will go on. The sorrowful will be comforted. The tempted will be delivered. The dead will be raised. There are going to be larger harvest homes and stronger doxologies and more jubilant hallelujahs. O oh, men and women, impenitent, committed to my charge, how can I give you up? If there be any power in prayer, in tears, in heartbreaking solicitations, you must come in. O oh, fire-crowned Sinai, unlimber now thy batteries. O oh, quaking Calvary, now plead thy love. O oh, day of judgment, now unsheath thy glory. O oh, heaven, display thy thrones. O oh, pit, flash forth thy terrors. And amidst the rising, and the falling, and the quaking, and the wailing, and the shouting, and the praying, as one billow of an aroused sea has been known to pitch a steamer with a thousand passengers high and dry upon the beach, so now this moment, with one surge of penitence and prayer, let all this audience be landed on the shore of eternal safety. My heart overflows with emotion when I think that I have another pastoral year less of work to do. I am not tired. God has been very good to me all these years. Notwithstanding the work I have been called to do here in the church and in the lay college and in the editorial chair, a combined work that many supposed and prophesied would crush me, I have never had a day of real sickness in my life, and a headache is to me unknown, save as some of my good friends with their hands on their hot temples have described it god has been very good to me i ascribe this health and prosperity first to god and then to the two facts that i have a very good home and a congregation who give me no annoyance they are in sympathy with me and my work if any of them do not like me i have been too stupid to find it out i thank you for all your forbearances toward me. I thank you for all the generosity with which you have met my worldly necessities. Above all, I thank you for the prayers that in public and private you have offered for me and mine. I hope to live and die with you. It is my highest ambition to be your servant for Jesus' sake. And when it is time for me to rest, then I want to be carried out through these very streets by the men who sit before me today. Their arms are good and strong, and they will know how to let me gently down into the last sleep. Many of them are my children in the gospel. They were good to me while I lived. I would not be afraid to trust myself in their arms when I am dead. And then, one by one, you will come out to the same silent neighborhood, and when the morning of the resurrection dawns, in its holy light we will wake up together and as i cry are you all here you will know my voice for you have heard it so often and you will answer me all here i believe in the communion of saints and the life everlasting 
Amen. The End End of Chapter 33 Recording by Marcia Payne End of Old Wells Dug Out by Thomas Talmadge